is Rob Ede. Cool. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Uh, morning, folks. Welcome to Rust Nation UK. Um, you're probably wondering, what is this crab doing, right? Um, <laughs> I think I saw this photo, and it was sort of a perfect encapsulation of, of the talk. It's obviously a crab, and it's, uh, how has it got the fish? How did it get the fish? I don't, I don't get it. But um, you know, obviously, this is something to do with extractors, and we'll get to what that means. But I think the, the reason that this photo uh, meant, meant so much about this talk is that it's not magic. Like, we know that magic isn't real, right? We know that, right? <laughs> um, so the crab has gotten this fish somehow. And extractors can feel magic at first, but they are, they are based in, in some real um, trickery of, of traits, really. It's, it's not magic, it's, it's science, <laughs> as they say. So in pre preparation for this talk, I um, wanted to really explain this, this second word here, ergonomic. So I use everyone's favorite new tool, ChatGPT. Um, and you'll see it starts off uh, a portmanteau of ego and economics. And oh, crap. I, I actually made a, a spelling error here. And <laughs> this causes some pretty funny stuff, right? Because a search engine would have just gone, oh, no, you spelled it wrong. But I like this part in the second paragraph. A developer may be resistant to feedback or suggestions from their colleagues if they feel that it challenges their sense of expertise or authority. Um, so I was not, not happy. But after reading that, I was surprised it didn't come with this photo also, Captain Economics himself. Uh, so OK, let's, let's correct that spelling. Starts out all right. Ergonomics is the design of systems to optimize human performance and well-being. Um, OK. First point in this list is a bit off, though. Ergonomic coding environments can help reduce mental and physical fatigue. Um, so I'd like to reintroduce my talk with the obviously correct tagline. Tricks of the trade, how to reduce physical fatigue by writing good code. Great. More standard definition of ergonomics goes something like this. Um, minimal operator discomfort, maximal productivity. And you can bring that into the world of software development a bit by redefining operator discomfort as uh, minimizing friction, really. So you, you, the API, um, library APIs that you use shouldn't be awkward. They shouldn't cause fights with the compiler. And you should also be able to do things that you want to do quickly. Um, now that's fine, but often this idea of ergonomics kind of comes down to this woolly feeling of uh, feels good. It feels good to use. It doesn't get in my way. Uh, and maybe even less than this, I just don't notice it exists because it's ergonomic. And I think traits really are the key to Rust's success in, in being able to build ergonomic APIs. Rust obviously leans very heavily on its trait system. Um, and in my view, it's, it's, the, it's Rust's best feature. Uh, even more so than the borrow checker for me. So uh, what's a trait? Let's ask a few different software communities. <sighs> I promise this is my one and only jab at Haskell developers, but uh, <laughs> let's try a different one. Maybe uh, Java developers. Well, OK, this isn't so far off, right? But this isn't where I took this quote from. I, this is from the Rust documentation, so I guess we have to admit once and for all, that they are kind of like an interface. Um, traits solve the productivity part of our uh, definition for ergonomics by being so prevalent throughout the standard library and throughout the ecosystem of crates as a whole. Um, and they also solve the friction part of our definition by letting us use types with some specific characteristics in a flexible and generic way. Uh, this is, again, a quote from the Rust documentation. So like, why? What's so good about traits? Um, is, is, are, are traits one thing? Is it one idea? No, it's, uh, there's a bunch of ideas and traits that make them so powerful, and this is, this is only some of them. So uh, let's just kick it off. A um, couple of examples. We, we've got a title uh, enum here we're going to use a little bit, which just has some honorifics, and then a name which uses the title enum uh, on the right-hand side. And for both of these, we might want to express the idea of converting this type into a string for use later. So we define two string on each of these structs. Now this is obviously, you know, you, you sort of hear, you, you understand that this is ripe for uh, abstraction. So the standard library has indeed a two string trait. Um, this isn't quite how you should do it in practice, but um, it works better for the, uh, the example here. So OK, great. Uh, we can convert any type into a string by implementing this, um, this trait. And then we know for sure that 
anything that implements the two-string trait can be used in the same way. And we'll see later that that can allow us to do things like trait bounds. There's, there's a bit of um, nuance here I'm skipping over because separate implementation blocks turns out to be quite powerful in this way. I'm going to introduce a, a custom trait to, to demonstrate this. Um, pretty simple, again, two French string. So I, I think this is, this is how the French do honorifics in that, in that way. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but note that the function signature here is uh, exactly the same as the standard library's two string trait. Um, so converting this into Java again, let's, let's think about this from an OOP perspective. Uh, when you have this interface that uh, well, two interfaces that define this same uh, signature. You you have to uh, you have to annotate the, the class with this, right? Um, which interface does this relate to? Um, is it neither? Is it two string? Is it two French string? Or is it both? Someone shout the answer. <laughs> both. That is the correct answer, and that's sort of not obvious. And if you wanted to have different implementations, you just can't. Right? Um, you need to, I don't know, I'm not a Java developer, but uh, <laughs> you, you'd probably end up doing some class extensions and uh, implementing the, the, the new one on that and stuff like this. But um, this is the power of having the separate implementation blocks, or one of the powers. We're not out of the woods uh, in Rustland, though, because now we've got an um, ambiguity. Um, the great thing here is that we can solve the ambiguity very easily by just uh, using the fully qualified path for the trait method here. Uh, yeah. The other thing that the separate implementation blocks lets you do is implement, uh, implement traits on foreign types. Um, so this, this uh, distinct positions turns out to be quite powerful. Um, Again, like, how would you even do this in Java? Uh, implementing a trait that you own on the standard string type, you, you can't extend like the string class. So again, you'd end up with some class extending string, and then you'd implement the interface on that, and it, it just it doesn't it doesn't feel good. You're not only adding boilerplate for yourself; you're potentially propagating that unnecessary need to your to your downstream users. This doesn't give us free license to implement any traits with any type, though. And that's due to something called the orphan rule, which loosely is either the type or the trait must be local. Uh, this is a logical or not an exclusive or. Um, at least historically, this is what the orphan rule meant. There's been some relaxation of the rules over the years. Um, alternatively, you can de Morgan's law this and say the type and the trait cannot both be foreign. This is just to stop us causing coherence problems uh, by doing something like this, implementing the standard iterator trait for the standard library's string. You're not allowed to do this. This would cause all, all sorts of problems. Cool. All right, default implementations. This is uh, an area where you really can improve um, ergonomics of, of the code. I want to draw your attention to the top left um, where it says required methods and it only has one in there, right? We only need to implement the next method to have a complete implementation of iterator for a type. The rest just use default implementations. Um, so for example, with a reduced view of the uh, iterator trait, notice that size hints already filled in, and this just serves as our default implementation for any type that doesn't override it. And if you do have a type that you know, guarantees that it produces one value from an iterator, you can override this and give that hint. Super traits. Uh, this is probably the uh, canonical example of what super traits look like. It's uh, similar to OOP explaining superclasses. Um, follows simple sort of reasoning that circles are shapes, but shapes uh, not all shapes are circles. So um, we want to make sure that shape, the shape trait is implemented for any type that also implements circle. Given this guarantee is defined on the trait itself, um, you can use methods from the super trait in default implementations without knowing anything else about the types it will be implemented on, uh, which is super useful. Uh, a more concrete example is uh, the standard library's error trait, which has 
two super traits, debug and display. Um, and this just means that for any, any type, again, we'll talk about bounds later, but we can bound on this trait and then always know that debug and display are, uh, are going to be present. Um, the reason this impacts ergonomics of, of your code is that you don't need to ask your users to implement new uh, methods when uh, existing traits already exist that express the same ideas, right? The error trait in this example used to use, um, used to require you to implement a description, I think it was called, and that just was not necessary because it already had this like display bound. Um, so we can just say the description is the display uh, implementation of, of the type. All right, associated types. Um, again, with the iterator trait, the associated type here is type item, and it's a little bit of uh, nuance whether you should use an associated type or a generic on, uh, on a trait. Um, but these uh, associated types also have the ability to link with any generics you do define. And this is typically used instead of type parameters or generics when there's only one practical or one logical value that can be placed here uh, because it helps, uh, it helps Rusty do some type inference down the line. This, this does cause um, maybe more ergonomic but less verbose code certainly in some cases. <clears throat> I mean, just consider an alternative iterator trait where it does have um, the type parameter here. You're, you're sort of, it, it's not obvious that for some types like this, this conceptual bytes um, type, that there should be any other value than U8, right? It's the only logical thing that you can iterate over in a collection that is called bytes. Like, this is just, um, this is just a good default. Um, when you're writing traits, though, it's not always obvious which design will be more ergonomic for the users. Um, as, a, uh, as a study for, for this particular trait, actually, um, the string, the standard library string, does not implement iterator. Um, any, any ideas why it doesn't? Right. It's, not, it's sort of not obvious whether you should use the machine representation of bytes or whether you should iterate over characters, which can be up to four bytes, right? So the string type makes this explicit, or it makes you make this explicit by having two methods. It has the chars method, which returns an iterator over the characters, and it also has the as bytes method, which you know, trivially um, slices our iterators over their uh, item content. So it forces you to write this down, which, uh, which implementation uh, or which type of iteration you want. All right, so we've been talking a little bit about some of these trait bounds. We're um, starting to build up some of these more complex traits now, like into iterator from the standard library. Um, now this has the same uh, type item as iterator, uh, but it also has um, the into iter, into iter ty associated type here which um, should be the type of the iterator you want to yield from the intuiter method, right? But we can express here, we need that type to implement iterator. We can't just assume that, we need to say explicitly. Um, and also the additional bound here is that the item uh, that the iterator yields needs to be the same item as we've defined above. Um, you might be thinking this is a bit uh, this is a bit redundant, isn't it? If we're saying the item on the intuiter iterator trait, like why are we duplicating this? But it turns out that this can be a more ergonomic way of um, of defining trait. How do I explain this? There's some cases where you want to just bound on this trait and then specify the type. So it gets a lot more um, verbose when you're trying to do trait bounds that sort of traverse down into associated types. Um, it gets messy. All right, as a couple of examples, um, the top one, we have a, a function with a generic T that implements display. Um, this is obvious, right? You have these all over the place. Um, and then following on from the super traits discussion, 
we also have uh, debug error, which bounds on error. And because debug is a super trait of error, um, we know for sure that we can debug print the, uh, the error here. I will talk a little bit about return positional infiltrate. Um, you'll see this written in, uh, in forums and in, in the issues as RPIT sometimes. So infiltrate provides a way of specifying unnamed but concrete types that implement a, spe a specific trait. Uh, it can appear in two places, the argument position here, um, where it acts as an anonymous type parameter, and return position, where it acts as an abstract return type. Now, crucially, what it doesn't let you do is something uh, like this. So even though string slices and integers, which we're returning from this function, both implement the standard library's display trait, you, you can't do this. Um, Infiltrate represents a, a single concrete type. It's just that you want the compiler to figure out what that type is. Um, and this becomes essential when return types get extremely verbose or, or even completely unnameable uh, due to some aspects of the type, uh, such as in this example, the, the closure and the mapping function. You, you can't name that type, um, so you can't use it uh, in, the, in the return type that you're expressing. For library authors, this turns out to be a really great way of improving ergonomics on your libraries because um, you, can prevent, um, you can prevent more breaking changes, as in you can change the underlying implementation details of this function and still return the same type, even if you know, the iterator, the concrete iterator type that you're returning has changed. Um, so you, you see this pop up more and more in libraries these days because it, it turns out it's just great for preventing unnecessary breakage. Um, in the case where you only, only care about this one implementation of the type. All right, uh, a couple more things to do additional reading. I'll let you take a photo of this if you want to uh, go into it. <coughs> uh, but yeah, these, um, these features of traits are great, but they don't come into the uh, extractor ideas that we're going to talk about. Uh, in a second, so uh, we're not going to talk about them. All right, on to the meat of it. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so um, I'm lead dev of Axis Web, so uh, I've taken this just straight from the Axis uh, RS homepage. Um, I just want to point out a few things about this example. We're obviously setting up an HTTP server and attaching some, uh, some handlers to it. So the index, uh, the index function here is a handler. It's connected to the server with this service method on app. Um, we're also, in, in that handler function, abstracting over the return type using the import responder in that return position that we talked about. Um, so you can kind of ignore the fact that we're using the routing macros here. The extractor pattern works exactly the same way without them. It's just that this, is, this produces more concise uh, examples, and just to prove it really quick, um, this is the expanded version, roughly, uh, to, to manual routing, and all we've done is just move the path here, method here, and the um, handler function reference here. But it works the same way. There's no macro magic going on with this pattern. Trust me. Um, all right, so let's get a bit more involved here. A new handler called hello, and this is attached with some routing info about the path, and this curly brace syntax means it's a dynamic path parameter. Um, so this will capture, similar to a regex, uh, part of the requested path. Uh, and we once again attach the hello handler in the same way with the service function. But this, this should already raise some flags, right? We're, we've taken two very different types uh, in terms of the, the, the function types up there and attached them in the same way to the application. Um, so I think it's useful just to have a think about really what the types of these functions end up being. Um, this is some imaginary syntax, but uh, just have a, have a check this out. Right, it seems like we've got three sort of dimensions of abstraction going on here. Um, we've got the, the return type or the responder type. Um, we've got the types of the parameters that can be passed in. We've also got the 
number of parameters that can be passed in. And um, it's well known that Rust doesn't support you know, variable arguments. So like, how, does this, how does this even work, right? It still feels like magic. Um, I'm going to dig a few layers down from the service call because, again, it doesn't care about um, the pattern doesn't care about the routing info. So this is really the, the function that we, we care about. And you can go and look up this in the docs. This is taken straight from um, the documentation. So here's sort of our three, uh, three layers of, uh, of abstraction I was talking about. The, from, from the bottom to the top, this is the, um, the variable return type. The second one is the uh, type of the arguments that we're passing in. And the first one is uh, the number of the arguments we're passing in. And that's it. The magic's already happened. Did you miss it? OK. Let's dive into these, uh, <laughs> let's dive into these traits a little bit, because like, the magic has actually just happened. <laughs> Firstly, from request, um, this has a lot of the features that we've been talking about, like super traits, um, like associated types trait bounds on the associated types, and uh, even one default implementation that allows for, you know, again, a, a more ergonomic API when you only want to extract um, not using the payload of the request that's coming in. Uh, this, is what I, this is what I wish it did look like, um, because of reasons async traits are not a thing yet. Um, so hopefully in, in the near future when all that stuff's been worked out, um, this is kind of what it will look like. That's sort of an aside. Um, importantly, from request is um, implemented for tuples from 0 to 12 in length, where every element is also uh, imp uh, implementing from request. That's something important to, to keep in mind for understanding this pattern. Uh, this slide's out of place. Sorry. <laughs> um, this is the other, hand, uh, the other trait that we saw in, in our signature for 2, is the handler trait. And this, uh, if, you, if you've seen the function traits, this looks kind of like the fn trait, um, except it returns a future that then returns the output at some point. Um, but again, I told you this is where the magic was happening, and I'm, I'm not sure it's still not clear which bit is the magic part, because we have this, um, in addition to the associated types, we have the type parameter args that then gets passed into call. Like, OK, maybe you see where this is going if you've used the function traits for any reason. Um, but again, we want to point out handlers implemented for functions with arity of 0 to 12, so the same range as the uh, from requests. And it aligns up the positions with the, the tuple of types that we're passing in with the arguments, uh, the, the, uh, the args type parameter here. And we use a, a macro to, to generate this, uh, the implementations for the various function arities. But for an example, um, using two parameters passing into the handler, um, it takes a little bit of uh, mental gymnastics to understand what this type is saying. But I think this, this points out sort of the, uh, the magic part. This turns the magic into science. Because we're implementing handler for this tuple of uh, arg1 and 2 for a function that takes two arguments. And this is the only implementation of uh, handler for a function of uh, arity2. So when there's only one choice for an implementation, Rusty is able to infer the, uh, the type parameter, right? So let's just go back. Um, we, we pass in the handler that has n arguments, and all we need to say uh, about this bound is that there is a set of arguments, because Rust will be able to infer from the function you pass in what this parameter is. Um, and then it follows from the rest of it that that set of arguments all needs to implement from requests. And because that tuple implements, that the tuple itself implements from requests, as we talked about earlier, this lets us just completely infer um, that the handler is valid, even with n uh, parameters being passed in. Um, to get a bit of a, uh, a concept for how this works, tops to bottom, uh, you can have a look at this. This is also in the documentation for the handler trait. So you can go and look at this anytime. 
Um, but effectively, if you start at the second part here, inferred <coughs> handler args, th this is sort of all it's doing. It's calling the from request trait on that tuple, which is then um, awaited and then passed into the handler, which is, as we saw, like a super basic. It just calls the function that you, uh, you gave it with the arguments that have been extracted from the request. And at the end of the day, it's just destructuring the tuple and then passing them in one at a time positionally. Uh, there's no magic. It doesn't like read the names. Like <laughs> Some people think that the, the macro reads the names of the um, parameters and like tries to match them up with the, the path segments, but it's just not the case. It's all, it's all positional. Um, and this, this is sort of it. In terms of real code, I actually put this slide in later, realizing that this does almost a better job of explaining what's actually going on than the documentation does, because this, this is it, top to bottom, what we're doing. Um, as long as you can, this is the same uh, trait bounds on this, uh, on this function here as the two function we saw earlier that is exposed publicly. Um, but this just goes top to bottom. It, it gets the handler, it extracts the requests from, uh, extracts the arguments from the request, and then calls your handler. <laughs> and that's, that's sort of it. And um, this sort of doesn't, it doesn't feel like magic anymore. And that kind of makes me sad a little bit. But uh, <laughs> it also, <laughs> it also make, gives me a great sense of pride that we, we came up with this, um, or we probably stole it from another language realistically, but um, that we can design APIs that look like this, right? We d we're not stuck back in the, the Express day, uh, the Node.js Express days where we have to have a request in and a response out, and that's just what the interface is for our, for our web server. We can be expressive with the types that we want to get out of the request just by saying, give me this type. <laughs> that's it. No, really, that's it. <laughs> Awesome. So we have quite a bit of time for some questions. If anyone has any questions, any of these topics are fine. <laughs> Thanks, Ernest. I, I, I like the tables. <laughs> All right. I think we've got a roving mic for questions. Oh, yeah. Um, I think you had your hand up first. Oh, right. So you're doing it. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Hi, thanks. Um, so I was just thinking about the, the arity restriction that you have. And so you, you have a macro that's just generating impulse for up to 12, right. uh, tuple up to 12. And it reminds me of two things. So one, you have const generics. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess, is it not possible to model that as like an array of, like, uh, of, like, uh, of arguments uh, uh, as a fixed length array? Um, and then secondly, it kind of reminds me of, in TypeScript, you've got something called veratic tuples which is a newish feature to the language. So is there like a, is there sort of like a open space in uh, the language for like maybe making making generic over like a tuple of any length or something right. like that? So you can get rid of like this this arbitrary restriction on how many impulses you decide to to uh, to actually generate. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, on the, on the first point there, um, the const generics idea wouldn't work just because the uh, the array stuff assumes that it's all the same type. But we want to be able to pass in up to 12 completely different and unrelated types, um, except for the, the, the one trait that they implement in common. Um, I think I left front end just too early to get the variadic tuples stuff. But uh, does that let you have uh, different, do, does it do that? Does it have different types, right? Up to any arity. So I think there's an effort in Rust to support that. but. It might be some private sealed trait oh. at the moment. I think there's a tuple trait, but I'm pretty sure it's not stable or public. Um, in the future, that might be possible. I think in practice, um, I haven't come across many use cases except in my own work where I need more than 12. But like, if people, if somebody 
submits a, an issue saying I need 30 and I'll just add another one. <laughs> <I> think, <laughs> we, we, we survived long enough with the, uh, what was it, array up to 32 trait. Like, we survived for quite a long time with that really awful trait that, that hurt ergonomics for, for, uh, for arrays. Like, it ma matters way more for arrays where you want to be able to say, you know, here's my thousand length like, list of characters for some reason. Um, yeah, I, again, I, I think it just doesn't, uh, it doesn't affect many things in practice, but it'd be, it'd be nice. <laughs> it'd simplify the macros. Okay, any other questions? Um, I've noticed that the um, API for Bevy looks very similar. Uh, hmm. Do you know if they use a similar trick? Uh, yeah, as far as I can tell, um, I remember seeing a talk from David Peterson who wrote uh, Axum, and he said he was inspired by Bevy for, uh, for his from request trait. <laughs> what should you, David? Um, so yeah, like this, this idea isn't new. I think I've, I've seen similar concepts in things like Spring Boot, which obviously has been around for far longer than even Rust itself. Um, I think they use some macro magic on top of that, but um, it's not implausible to think that any sort of any previous language with an interface concept has has been able to do this somehow through their type system. Um, and almost certainly Haskell has been able to do it with their weird web servers. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> okay, cool. So the next talk is in this room is going to be at 11, and it's um, by Luciana Mamio, who's doing what I learned by solving 50 advent of code challenges in Rust. But before you go, one final round of applause for Rob, please. <laughs>